Hello and welcome to our second Holy Week Reflection on Tuesday of Holy Week. As we continue our journey this year through Mark's Gospel, reflecting on the story, the journey from Palm Sunday, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, to the events that we remember and celebrate, that just the climax of all that Jesus came to do on Good Friday with his crucifixion, the cross. So as we draw near today, let us again just take a moment to pray and prepare this for this time of worship together. Let's pray. Gracious God, our loving Father, thank you for the gift of the freedom that we have to worship you, to gather around your word and in this holy week to journey together in reflection upon the events that we know well. But each time we remember them and rehearse them again, we're helped to see some fresh understanding or aspect of what we've known and Lord, we rely on you by your Holy Spirit to come and to help us to have that understanding and to apply your living word and let it bear its fruit through our lives. Lord, as we come before you this day, we thank you for your love that sent Jesus in pursuit of all who would respond and listen, who would turn to you in repentance and open their hearts and lives to your grace. And so we come again today, Lord, we set aside whatever else might distract us in this day that we might focus on you. Holy Spirit, meet us where we are. Bless us in your presence. And Lord, as we feed on your word, would you nourish our spirits and transform who we are and how we live so that Jesus, you might be seen through our lives and that we might resemble you more closely. Lord, forgive us for the sins that stand against us, we ask your cleansing once more. And thank you for the blood you shed at Calvary, that we might come and ask for such forgiveness. We thank you, Father, for the compassion and the grace which sent Jesus to seek and to save the lost. And so we ask that you come now to us and upon us and help us to understand your word and to rest in its truth and power. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. We continue then in our journey through Mark's Gospel, and today we're going to look at uh, the next reading that we have, which comes from uh, Mark chapter 12 and verses 1 through to verse 12. So Mark 12, 1 to 12, the parable of the vineyard, or the workers in the vineyard. Jesus then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall round it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Amen. There's a saying, isn't there, that possession is nine-tenths of the law. It's not a legal saying, and it's not a legal claim. 
But nonetheless, there's a, a reality, isn't there, that if we possess something or if we are, uh, if we, we have something that belongs to somebody else, the hardest thing for the other person might be to get it back from us if we're not willing to return it. Certainly over the years, I have loaned out my share of books uh, to other people and forgot to take a note of who I lent them to, being convinced that I would remember who I'd loaned them to and never seeing them again. And I've probably borrowed books from other people and failed to return them. It's a two-way thing. And unless you remember and ask for it back, then you keep what belongs to somebody else intentionally or unintentionally. In terms of housing or employment, of course, we know that increasingly as the decades and centuries have gone on, tenancy rights and employment rights have greatly strengthened and increased so that where once the landowner or the homeowner or the employer might have the right just to chuck you out, to evict you or to terminate your employment, now those rights are enshrined much more carefully in law. So that if somebody has a tenancy, you can't simply decide you don't want them anymore. There's a contract and terms to be fulfilled. And if you're an employer, then you have to uh, terminate someone's employment according to due process, whether through a redundancy process or by giving them the appropriate series of verbal and written warnings uh, prior to dismissal. And, and that's as it should be in order that people are protected, that their livelihoods and their homes and so on are protected. The principle is that if you're in, it can be harder to get you out. Squatting has no protection in the law, certainly in Scotland, but as soon as you have any kind of tenancy or contract, then you have rights. But what's the extent of those rights? Imagine renting your home, maybe you do, and maybe you've lived there for a long time. Certainly my grandparents uh, rented for many years before they bought their council house in Edinburgh. But in all my uh, childhood, and certainly my mother growing up, she never knew another home. And that house, although it technically belonged to the council and was rented until they bought it, uh, was their home. And the longer you live under a tenancy or a rental agreement, the more you may well start to think of a property as yours. You might even invest in it. You might get permission to redecorate a room according to your taste. You might even decide, well, we're going to spend a little money here and with the landlord's permission, maybe replace the bathroom if he's not willing to or, or whatever. You might well decide that you want to spend money on a property, but at the end of the day, you don't own it. But certainly we end up with an attachment to property. We end up with a sense that this is my home. This is maybe where I raise my children. This is where I moved in perhaps when I got married, although the days of those kinds of long-term tenancies are perhaps no more. But certainly in other parts of the world, in Germany and Switzerland, the renting property is, is the, the, the norm rather than home ownership. And so you can spend a very long time in a property and have a very real and understandable sense that it's your home. You've got all these connections and you've lived your life there. Uh, this is the place that, that belongs uh, to you and to your story. A landlord might be the one you call on to fix the roof or replace the boiler, but there's that sense that this is my home. And so that, if you like, is the context of this parable we think about today. We're told the story of a vineyard that an owner planted, and he uh, planted the vineyard, put a wall around it, dug a wine press, put a watchtower, did all the things to set it up, but had no intention of actually operating it as a vineyard. He was going to rent it out to tenant farmers who would work the vineyard for him, and he would receive as his rental income a proportion of the harvest from the grapes when the time came. A reasonable and fair arrangement and one that was not at all uncommon. Jesus' parables were always drawn from the common experience of the people he was teaching. And so they knew only too well the principle of tenant farming, that they might not own land, but if you worked it, you got a return from it. And so here's a story of a, of a, of a vineyard that has been tenanted out. But the peculiarity, the strange and unexpected dimension, is the sheer brazen defiance of the tenants who refuse to pay any rent who refused to give any kind of return whatsoever to the owner of the vineyard in terms of the harvest that they reap. And so when the uh, owner of the vineyard sends servants 
then they start off by sending the servant away empty-handed and refuse anything. And then, of course, as the parable goes on, we find that the thing escalates, that the owner sends other servants, and this time, instead of just sending them away empty-handed, they beat them, and then we're told that they kill the next one. And then there's a series of servants, and so the owner has this series of individuals. It's just as well, it's a, it's a parable, because to actually stop and think about the number of physical casualties that the parable implies is, is monstrous. Here is property owned by a landowner, and the people that he sends, some of them are actually being killed. The climax of the parable, of course, is that the owner of the vineyard finally decides to send his own son, imagining that the son would come and command respect where the other servants had not. And yet, of course, we know that they decide that this being the heir is the one that they prize, uh, the, 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 the prize victim, if you like. And if they kill the victim, uh, if they kill the, the, the heir, the son, then they will get the vineyard for themselves. It's a macabre and brutal parable. It's extreme when you actually pause to think about what that looks like. And Jesus then says to those listening, well, what will the owner do? And quite reasonably and understandably, the owner will come and take revenge on these tenants who have been responsible for this series of violent uh, assaults and murder, and of course, culminating in the murder of the owner's own son. He'll take his revenge, kill them, throw them out of the vineyard, and then tenant it out to other people. And Jesus uh, tells this story and it concludes with the Pharisees and the Sadducees beginning to conspire to kill Jesus. What an irony. Here's a story in which the owner, uh, in which, sorry, the tenant farmers conspire to kill the son. And we're told that the effect of Jesus telling the parable is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees begin to conspire to kill Jesus, the son. It's almost as if they can't see the irony in what they're doing. Yesterday, and of course on Palm Sunday, we reflected on Jesus coming into Jerusalem as a herald of judgment, as a king riding on a donkey, the foal of a donkey. As Jesus coming in to claim and to reclaim his place as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, fulfilling messianic prophecies, raising expectations amongst the people that God had really come amongst them and was uh, preparing to, to deliver them. They thought they were going to be delivered from Roman occupation and rule. But of course, what God was looking for was a different kind of victory was looking for the honor and the reverence, was looking for the return and the fruit and the fruitfulness, the loyalty and the commitment of his own people to him. The people of Israel and of Jerusalem wanted the Romans out so that they could have the city, the vineyard, if you like, back to themselves. They were as concerned about having their own place and space as those tenant farmers were about making sure that the vineyard would be theirs and not the owners. And so Jesus comes in this week as a herald of judgment. He doesn't come in any way as a, a meek victim, as one who was just minding his own business and other people cruelly or brutally set upon him. Jesus in all of his actions is coming forth announcing, announcing one way or another that judgment is coming, raising his profile, and so the, the cursing of the fig tree that we looked at yesterday was a warning of the coming curse of God on all that which was not bearing or producing or yielding fruit to him. The overturning of the tables and the merchants' benches in the temple courts, uh, a visible sign of Jesus uh, coming in judgment against all that which would turn people away from or distract people or get in the way of people and God. And here in this parable that Jesus tells today, a warning of a judgment that will come against those who refuse to yield fruit and fruitfulness to God. Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it on the seas and established it 
on the waters. Whose is the earth? Is it ours? Do we own it? Did we make it? Does this world belong to us? Do we have the right to claim it for ourselves, to treat it as though it was our own possession at our own disposal? Certainly there are many who do behave as though this world was ours to plunder and rape and use and abuse and climate change is but one of many expressions of the ways in which the world is suffering at the hands of those who are its tenants. Jesus' words and actions are deliberately designed to remind the people that the world is God's and that we must give an accounting for our treatment of it and behavior in it. This parable is a simple and profound warning, a brief, powerful summary of the history of humankind's relationship with God, a concise and accurate portrayal of the events that would take place in just a few days. This is a powerfully prophetic parable. What is the climax of it? The killing of the owner's son. Jesus was not unaware that the days and the journey that were set before him in Jerusalem would climax and result in the death of the son, in his own death upon a cross, at the hands of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who, like the tenant farmers, claimed ownership of something which was God's. And Jesus knew that his death was coming and his pronouncements were against the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They saw themselves as the owners and controllers of God's nation, his temple, his people. It was the Sadducees who controlled the temple worship and the priesthood. It was the Pharisees who interpreted the law and sat in judgment on the people, who prescribed the correct interpretations of the law who decided how and when and whether forgiveness could be dispensed. They set themselves up as the owners of God's kingdom, of the rulers of that world. And their allegiance was more to their own power base and to themselves than it genuinely was to God. They'd ceased to be tenants and had taken over the rights of owners, just like the tenants in the vineyard. So we should be careful. If we ever imagine that somehow we are experts on God, that we are those who are in a position to sit in judgment over other people, that we are in any way controllers of God's world or of his truth. It's a warning that comes especially to those of us in leadership or ministry who preach and pronounce, lest we forget that we too are but heralds and torchbearers, ambassadors for God those who carry the light and help others to believe in the good news, but must always carry before us that sense of tenancy, of humility, of accountability to God, and then we point to Jesus and not to ourselves. And so the warning at the end of this parable is the warning of a judgment to come that we will all face. For the earth is the Lord's, and it's to him that we will give account. We came into this world with nothing and we take nothing with us, with, with us from it. And so with this parable, Jesus raises the stakes. The King of Kings presents his warning of the judgment to come on all those who treat the earth and above all who treat the King of the earth and the son of the King of the earth with anything less than humility, respect and reverence. We are merely tenant farmers. The earth is the Lord's. We give to Caesar what is Caesar's in our human citizenship, but we must also give to God what is God's. You know, human science and an understanding, human skill and ever-expanding knowledge, the ever-advancing boundaries of scientific understanding might well deceive us and, and do deceive many people into thinking that, that we and we alone are masters of the universe. We can't even make it out of our own solar system, of course. But nonetheless, we imagine that we are the highest power sometimes. Yet the reality is very different. I believe we have two choices in this life. We're either on the side of those who honor and revere Jesus and respect that the earth is the Lord's and not something that we fabricated or that we owned or that we can claim as our own that we recognize that the God is the rightful owner of the world and he alone will determine its future. Or on the other hand, we might ally ourselves with those who seek to kill God, 
to declare, as the German philosopher Nietzsche once famously did, that God is dead. Deny the Son his recognition and his place, and arrogantly seek to take and plunder for ourselves everything that this world and this life might offer. Of course, to take that latter course is to take the course of the tenants who ultimately found themselves at the mercy of and answerable to an angry vineyard owner who came to take revenge on those who had not only seized his property, but more importantly and significantly had the blood of his workers and above all his son on their hands. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Kiss the son, lest he become angry, we read in Psalm 2. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And to him every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Whether out of devotion and agreement and adulation or whether as those who are angrily and defeatedly forced to recognize that when they try to take God's world for themselves and rule it in their own way and plunder it for themselves with no regard for God or respect to him, they had got it very, very wrong. And so Jesus journeys towards his cross, not an innocent victim, but as one coming, proclaiming prophetically a coming judgment and claiming and insisting and calling people to a repentance and a recognition of God provoking authorities and pointing the finger at those who had stolen God's world for themselves. Yes, his provocation would result in a cross, but as we know, an empty tomb was the climactic affirmation and declaration of the truth, and the powerful reality of all that Jesus came to say and do and will yet return to come and claim for his own. Let's pray together. Loving God, our Heavenly Father, we recognise, Lord, how at home we find ourselves in our uh, houses and homes, sometimes in our world and our uh, sense of it being at our disposal. We recognise, Lord, the ways in which we've abused and plundered this planet, bespoiled it, raped it, taken its resources for ourselves and uh, in ways that have changed and are changing the planet and its ability to sustain life. Father, we recognize that we have been in so many ways very poor stewards of your creation, often out of an arrogance that it's all for us to take, with scant regard for those coming after us and even less regard that you, the living God, are the owner of the vineyard. Lord, forgive us when we settle into our tenancy in ways that arrogantly fail to remind us that it is to you that we give account of how, not just how we've handled the things that pass through our hands, but how we've treated you and responded to you and how we've treated one another. Lord, you look for a harvest. You look for fruit and fruitfulness. You look, Lord, for a return on your investment. And that, Lord, you look for in our expression of love to you and to others. So we ask forgiveness and cleansing for all the ways in which we've lacked fruitfulness or failed to give to you, Lord, the return that you deserve. And we pray, Lord, that you will, will help us to live as those who humbly recognize that all that we have and are, all, that we, uh, all the ways in which we live are for you and towards you. Lord, forgive us our selfishness Forgive us our indifference towards you and help us, Lord, to honour and revere the Son that we, Lord, may be those who uh, enjoy the Master's favour and walk in your delight. Lord, would you comfort us and hear us and help us where we need your help and support, where, Lord, perhaps through the difficulties of this pandemic we are struggling or have struggled. Lord, look with mercy upon us, but would you revive us? Would you help us, Lord, we pray? Would you uh, enable us to be fruitful men and women? And Lord, we thank you for all that Jesus has done for us as we continue our journey towards the memory of his cross this coming Good Friday. Lord, hear and help us, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 
Thanks again for being part of this little journey through Holy Week with me. I uh, hope all is well with you. Do get in touch if we can help or support you in any way. Otherwise, we'll continue our journey tomorrow uh, at the same time with the next little part of Mark's Gospel. God bless you. Bye-bye. <laughs>